I'm Ramses. And I'm the Vesper. And we're here for another edition of Back in Time, episode number 12. Before we start this look back in time, don't forget to please like, comment, subscribe, and... Ring that bell. So we can bring you many more back in times like this in the future. For this edition of Back in Time, we're going to take a look at... The Super Mario Brothers movie, and how retro is done right sometimes in movies. It is April 5th, 2023. We just got back from seeing the Super Mario Brothers movie in IMAX. Not 3D, because that probably would have given us a headache. Still, it was a lot of fun, and if you are a fan of nostalgia, if you're a fan of the Super Mario Brothers, have I got the movie for you. It is definitely worth the view. It is great. See it, and if you can see it in IMAX, do so. It's an experience like no other. Before we begin with anything else, the shame that was the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie has been erased. They finally did a video game movie correct. And it is the best one to date that has been done correctly. And that is the Super Mario Brothers movie. That's right. Made by Illumination and released Universal Pictures with Nintendo heavily, and I want to stress this, heavily involved with the making of this movie. And I think that's an important thing when you have a property like this. Because look at the 1993 movie, and we all know the disaster of the 1993. One day we might review that movie, it won't be today. We're going to do a good movie worthy of a review, which is the new 2023 version of Super Mario movie. As a matter of fact, they even reference the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, with their opening song in this. Really amazing the amount of nods they had. And some people might be like, oh, that's too many nods. No, that's why this works so well. They are pulling on your nostalgia strings all throughout this, but in such an effective way. Now, the reason why this is not just a Super Mario Brothers review is because we're gonna mention there's been other movies that have done it and not as effectively. Like we can look back at the Ghostbusters Afterlife. That's nostalgia done sort of right, but mostly wrong. Having moments that are Easter eggs and moments to take notice of because they remind you of something previous. It's not the most effective way to do nostalgia. This movie realized we are Nintendo. We can do all the Nintendo nods and icons and sight gags that you want, and that's how you do it. They had his boss was wearing a Wrecking Crew hat. Do you realize what Wrecking Crew is? One of the first NES games that had Mario, and it was Wrecking Crew. You have Jumpman, and Jumpman was the original name of Mario. I mean, there's nods after nods after nods, and they work effectively because you believe this is all tied into the Nintendo universe, and Nintendo's very proud to say, Yes, we went from here to here to here, and now look at where we are. Nintendo was sort of doing their own, look at us now, and the fans are clapping. Yes, look at you now. They did it correctly, and they did it in such a way that it didn't take away from the movie, but rather felt as if it was a part of the movie. So you even had them as babies. Remember Super Mario World 2? They were babies. They even had a moment, and they looked exactly, exactly like the characters doing their baby forms. It didn't relate to the Yoshi world, but it looked exactly like those characters do. And they had, for no reason at all, they had the cannons from Super Mario 64 aiming at an island as they're walking by. I'm like, why? What is the relevance of this? Well, it's a show in this world that really is how things are set up. You just walk somewhere and there's a random cannon that you can jump into to shoot yourself to an island. Have you always wondered why is that there? Well, it's part of the Mushroom Kingdom. They have random cannons just lying around for you to use. And if you're wondering about why in the games there's all these random blocks floating in midair or platforms going up and down, well, guess what? They explain it here because that's just how it is, folks. Now, they did make some changes. Donkey Kong can now speak normally without going, ooh, ah, ah, ee, ee. The voice actor for Donkey Kong was, that's right, Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen just talked like Seth Rogen. And you know something? It worked. Why did it work? Because it still had the proper interactions between him and Mario. Mario and Donkey Kong are the original rivals. Jumpman was against Donkey Kong in the original Donkey Kong game. And that's where their rivalry between them started. And then they were rivals in the cartoons and on and on and on. So it was great that they had them butting heads because that made sense. Donkey Kong and Mario are not friends. They have been bitter enemies since the beginning of time. And having Seth Rogen do the voice, well, we can understand what he's saying. You can feel the rivalry, and they're both trying to win each other over. It worked very well how they did it. Uh, the biggest problem a lot of people have with this movie is Chris Pratt doing the voice of Mario. And the reason they didn't like it is because, oh, that's not what Mario sounds like. Why not use the Mario actor? Well, Charles Martinet does appear, and he does the voice of a funny spoof character who's supposed to be a fan of Jumpman, and he's always going, wahoo, yahoo, in his Mario voice. I think they didn't want it like that. They wanted it more of a, a big name recognition where the characters have their own personalities, and it works. Believe me, you're going to go in this thinking, why is Chris Pratt the voice of Mario? And then you hear it, and you're like, oh, yeah, I can see that. It worked very well, actually. And Jack Black voiced Bowser, the King of the Koopas, and he did an excellent job 
as coming off as King Koopa, which was kind of fun. Just a little bit over the top. But they also referenced the new Bowser. They had him in the white wedding suit that you've seen him in the more current games, but at the same time acting like his old self. Now, Jack Black was so over the top because he's a singer. He does sing in a lot of his movies, and they use that a lot with his playing the piano, and he was singing a ridiculous song about Princess Peach. Peaches! The... Peaches! Right, in the most ridiculous voice, and then he talks like Bowser again when he's done. And they did a very good job of representing both Toad and Princess Peach in here. She had the best reaction of all, being stuck in a kingdom full of mushroom people for an entire life. Upon me, Mario. Oh my god, you're human! Come with me! They're respecting all their previous IPs while telling a very good story about two brothers looking for each other in a strange land where they're separated and overcoming adversity making new friends, and just trying to find their way in the world. This movie was actually very wholesome, which is a lot different from the actual Mario Brothers game, which you're just trying to rescue a princess. Now, they sort of mixed all the Super Mario. This is not just a Super Mario Brothers 1 based story. This is more Super Mario Brothers 2. We had all four characters. You had Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Princess Peach. Luigi gets captured midway through, so it's really just Toad, Donkey Kong, Mario, and Princess, but it still works because you have characters that are relevant because they have a Mario Kart moment all the sun show up and that's where all these characters show up together anyway so there you go another connection where you would have donkey kong with them because donkey kong is very clearly in the mario kart series it, it was just very nod after nod after nod and it worked so well they're putting the nostalgia in with the story as we mentioned before in ghostbusters afterlife they focused too much on the previous movies it stood out as its own thing as only a fan moment but in the Super Mario Brothers movie, they combined together to make them intricate elements of the story and try to answer some of the questions that you had when you were playing the games. Why is it like this? Why is it like that? Well, they try their best to explain the movie in short little snippets, but not enough to take away from the main story. Another movie that did very well with nods to nostalgia and its origins was Wreck-It Ralph. Now in Wreck-It Ralph, they referenced all these old arcade games, but they made it seamless when they talked about these games. They didn't focus on too much. They were there, they were nods, and they were good nods because they didn't take away from the story of the original Wreck-It Ralph movie. So this movie had that same kind of feel, except this is real to them. Even though it's a cartoon, this whole everything, the real world and their world is all real. And I think that's the connection they had to the 93, is us traveling from the real world of Brooklyn, New York into the Mushroom Kingdom world. But Wreck-It Ralph did it well because it was not trying to change things. It wasn't trying to shove things in your face. It was using nostalgia and references properly. And this movie did that too. You had almost every Mario game in some way referenced. You even had all the new items. You had the mini mushroom, you had the Tanuki suit, and you had the ice flower. You had so many items that are from so many later games. Even the cat suit, it comes into play here. They were not afraid to say, yeah, these, these items are just commonplace. Yeah, we pick them up so easily in the game. That's because they are that common in this world. You can just punch a block and you don't know what you're going to get. And whatever you get, you can use as a power-up. You get hit once and you lose the power-up. Even the mushroom, it makes you bigger and buffer. You get hit, you lose it, and you're back to normal. If that's how it works in the video game. That's how it worked in the cartoon. The only time they took any real liberties with power-ups is later in the movie where they have Donkey Kong getting a fire flower, which you never see in any of the games. It would have been cool they really stretch it, but just the idea that these power-ups just work on anybody. Anyone can punch a block and you can just get whatever power it is, and until you get hit, that's what you get to use. So it was a cool part. Now, one of the best parts of the movie is the Mario Kart race, right? They had a whole moment where they're racing out of the Kong Kingdom, and they're all on carts. And so they explain that pretty much the Kongs are the ones that build all the carts that get used. And then they're on Rainbow Road, which is the most famous road because it's in every single Mario Kart game in a different variation. It was kind of like a Mad Max movie where you had all the evil vehicles trying to get you. And they even reference the most feared weapon of Mario Kart ever, the blue shell. Overall, this movie took all the things you love from Mario, put it in there, and they did a very good job representing it. In this movie, they are doing that with Aha, if you're a Mario fan, you'll, you'll get it, but they're trying to put logic to everything we see in the game. They're trying to show why punching a block gets it, they show it. Why blocks disappear when you're walking, they show it. Why there's cannons everywhere, they show it. Where the Yoshis live, they show it. Why there's so many different worlds, they show it. And it is what it is, that's how it works in this world, that's the answer. But it's not just the moments, it's also the music as well. Now, if you're into retro like we are, we played the original games back in the day, so we know pretty much about all of the little nods from all the Mario games. And in the music they played, they pulled out some real good music from the 80s and 90s to play, and it soon became obvious over halfway in that this was not just for kids, they were pandering to the adults as well, 
who grew up with it. Yeah, they really went out of their way to make sure that both sets of demographics were taken care of. The kids that, they, of course, they want to cater. This is a cartoon. It's Super Mario. They want to cater to them. But you also want to get the Gen X and the Millennials who grew up with a lot of this stuff. And they had a lot of nods. They had a lot of 80s and 90s regular music, by the way. It wasn't just Mario-related music. So they had a song, and it's funny that this song showed up because I always reference to Vesper that in my gym class, they would always ask what song you want to play, and someone would always whip out a Beastie Boys cassette tape and play this exact song, and you got to fight till you write to a party where the two songs that they played all the time in gym class, so when No Sleep to Brooklyn showed up, I thought that was hilarious. And they also had Bonnie Taylor, they had AHA, ACDC. It was amazing that they just whipped out these random 80s and 90s songs out of nowhere, and here you go. And of course, they had Super Mario themed songs to remix. Like, they had such nods. Anytime a power-up was used, it'd be like from the game that it was from, you would hear it in the background, a part of an orchestrated song. It was really cool. And that's part of doing nostalgia right. And like in some of the other newer movies, they would reference the older song, but in remixes. Not this one. They kept the original songs just in the background. If you're listening, you can hear it. So, I mean, they did a lot of things right. And most of the nostalgic movies you see pull on your heartstrings for retro. Don't do it right. They either give you one or the other or too much of one and not enough of the other. So they dotted every I, they crossed every T, they referenced every Mario important reference that you can think of in this movie in one way or another. A lot of people can say, oh, that's what's not good about the movie, but I'm on the other side where I say that's what makes this movie great. They cater to the fans. Sometimes making people happy is a good thing too, and this movie makes fans of the Mario series or Nintendo in general very happy. They did everything you could think of. Overall, this movie is true to its story origins, although they changed some things to make it fit in the movie. They respected the fans. They respected all the content as best they could. They gave you nods from all the Mario spinoffs like Donkey Kong. They did everything in their power to make an appeal to fans old and young. They did it in a respectable way. It's going to get mixed reviews. It's not going to be for everybody. You have to be a fan. You probably have to be a little understanding that Mario Universe is weird and you have to understand that you're going to try to make sense of it. And they throw in Mario's family, which is very strange and out of nowhere, but it still worked. I liked what they did. If you go in with an open mind and you are a fan, there's no reason why you wouldn't like this movie. There's really nothing bad about this movie unless you're really looking for something bad in this movie, which people do. People look for problems. You're going to find a problem. I don't see there's really any problems. But again, we're going to get to a review right now. I think that covers everything. And now, as always, because we are a review channel, we are going to give our final reviews here on what we thought of the Super Mario Brothers movie, 2023, out of five stars, with five being the best, and of course, zero being the worst. And of course, Vesper gets to do the thoughts first. As a movie, I'm going to give it, actually, a four stars. The reason I'm giving this a four stars is I'm a fan of the series. I grew up with Mario, and I am not afraid to say that. This movie was made for fans like me. I recognize most of the nods, and I'm sure there's tons of Easter eggs I missed because I was just so enjoying the movie. It was a fun movie. It's not a great masterpiece of a movie, that's for certain, but it's fun, it draws you in, it tells a good story, it respects the core content, it gives good music, and it's made for the entire family to see. Nothing to offend anyone, it really respects the content, and pulls on the retro heartstrings through all of the little nods they give through the movie. I think the movie was great. I had a lot of fun. I can't remember enjoying a movie so much in a while. How can you not like Super Mario? Well, 1993, you cannot like Super Mario. So Mario being the title is not enough of a reason for a good movie. Of course, you have to go in skeptical, and I will say... I enjoyed it. I loved the musical nods. I loved the characterizations. I loved the style they used, even though some of the characters look a little weird. I thought Donkey Kong and Princess uh, Peach's styles were a little strange in this, but you get used to it very quickly. I liked the voice actors they use. I liked the storyline. I liked Bowser's over-the-top characterization. I liked just everything. Even Toad was a great character. It was just a lot of fun. I'm also giving this four stars, which I'm shocked. I did not know I would like this movie that much. You know me, I'm a tough critic sometimes. I'm not always uh, very generous. But I left with a smile on my face. I mean, they even had uh, closing moments where they show more happened afterwards, which I love when they do the uh, post credit stuff. They did that here. They gave clues that there's going to be more coming. A lot of good stuff left to look forward to. I loved it. I loved it. Please see Super Mario Brothers movie. It's a movie that does it right when you love nostalgia. This is a very nostalgic, how did it all start? How did this all happen? And it does it in a very friendly and not obnoxious way. So that is our thoughts and why we think this movie is so great. We didn't go into an in-depth review because we wanted to talk about the things they did right to make the movie so good 
and I hope you understand where we're coming from, and we hope that you would have similar thoughts after seeing this movie, which we highly recommend you do. And you can't get more retro and nostalgic than movies based on video games or video games based on movies. It's not based on a specific Super Mario Brothers game, but more the universe and franchise itself. So I think that's where they played it safe. So yes, nostalgia done right, references done right, retro done right. Here you go, Super Mario Brothers movie. Enjoy it. Let us know what you thought of it after you see it. We can't wait to hear your feedback. What did you like? What do you wish they did better? And what do you hope they do in the next movie if there is a Super Mario Brothers movie too? Besides Yoshi, which of course I think he will be. That goes without saying. After all, everybody loves Yoshi! That's right. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Back in Time. We had a lot of fun taking another trip back in time and a look at Super Mario Brothers movie and nostalgia in general and references in movies such as this. We hope to see you again soon. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and of course... Ring that bell. And we'll see you all next time on Vesper's Retro Reviews. Thanks for joining us, everybody.